We do begin tonight with some signs of growing unrest and anger inside of Haiti to go with the abject desperation there. Within the last few hours, the Reuters news organization did receive a disturbing report from a Time magazine photographer on the ground in Haiti. According to the photographer, in some places in Port-au-Prince, in at least two places, survivors of the earthquake have set up roadblocks using corpses to protest the lack of aid actually getting to the people. It's now been about 52 hours since that country was devastated by a massive earthquake. And tonight, search and rescue missions continue. And the Red Cross estimates that between 45 and 50,000 people may have lost their lives. Haiti's president, René Preval, announced today that 7,000 earthquake victims have already been buried. And tonight, the first American victim of the earthquake has been identified by name. She is 57-year-old Victoria DeLong of California. She's a 27-year veteran of the U.S. State Department. Ms. DeLong was stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince. She was apparently killed during the quake when her home collapsed. The grim reality of the situation on the ground in Haiti is evident in some of the incredible reporting that's coming out of there right now. Today, NBC's Tom Yamas made his way into Haiti from neighboring Dominican Republic. Here's what he found when he got there. Once we got into Haiti, um, it is truly an unbelievable sight. There are... Uh, Bodies on the streets, uh, f children. <laughs> people are actually using uh, their cars as ambulances to transport people to and from the border or to any hospitals. But the problem is there are no hospitals at this moment. Uh, people are living outside of churches. It's just a really unbelievable and unimaginable sight. The one thing that stuck out is that people are still being civil in Haiti. People are walking around. There's at least two million people just walking in the streets. They're trying to walk out of the country. Uh, but they're acting civil. According to one report tonight, that civility may be beginning to break down, at least in some places. The main problem at this point is a problem of logistics, getting the tide of rescue and relief aid that has been directed toward Haiti actually to the people who so desperately need it. The chief obstacle right now is that most of those supplies are being flown into Haiti from every corner of the globe, flown into an airport that has one runway, has one road in and one road out. United States Southern Command has taken control of the airport, but the sheer volume of supplies coming into Haiti has nearly paralyzed that airspace. The other main entryway into Haiti's capital Capital is through its port. That option is also presenting problems tonight. This is what the port looked like before the earthquake. Uh, here's what it looks like today. Uh, as you can tell from this image, the port is non-operational essentially at this point. Three working cranes that have all been destroyed, a main dock that is now partially submerged underwater. With the Haitian government essentially unable to respond to the needs of its people, it has largely been left to the international community to at least try to help. And after suffering so much for so long to face this new horror, uh, must cause some to look up and ask, uh, have we somehow been forsaken? To the people of Haiti, we say clearly and with conviction, you will not be forsaken, you will not be forgotten. In this your hour of greatest need. America stands with you. The world stands with you. We know that you are a strong and resilient people. You have endured a history of slavery and struggle, of natural disaster and recovery. And through it all, your spirit has been unbroken and your faith has been unwavering. So today, you must know that help is arriving. Much, much more help is on the way. Today, some of that help began to arrive. In addition to aid supplies that managed to get into Port-au-Prince Airport, more than 100 U.S. soldiers from Fort Bragg's 82nd Airborne Division landed in Haiti. Their mission is to help distribute aid and provide security in what is now an essentially ungoverned capital. Joining us now from Port-au-Prince, Haiti, is the anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News, Brian Williams, and NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders. Uh, Kerry and Brian, thank you both so much uh, for joining us again tonight. Bring us up to speed. Well, first of all, Rachel, um, a bit of the activity here on the airstrip. We have a uh, USC-17. They're waiting for at least 100 onboard guests tonight, people who were attached to the U.S. Embassy uh, here in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. This is very common. So many aircraft all day and all night, it's already impossible to track them. They come in with pallets of material, and if it works correctly, they leave with people on board. 
Uh, before handing it off to Kerry, I'll tell you, our, our on-air team today, all of us fanned out to different locations in Port-au-Prince. And it, it, is, it is almost impossible to describe what we saw. Uh, on our part, the most banal and insulting sight of what appeared to be a child's body on a plywood gurney wrapped in a blanket on a hot day, dead and abandoned. Uh, and if you try to count up and care for all the bodies that are outside tonight in this city, it is an impossible task. Um, and it's beyond sad and wrenching and tragic and shocking. And you run out of, of uh, ways to describe it. Uh, Gary Sanders was out in it and saw an entirely different view. Brian, there are, there's not enough space in the graveyards here for all the dead. I went to a graveyard today where some folks gathered with their loved ones to say goodbye. They got between two graves that were existing graves, space about that wide. They dug a grave and they placed the bodies of four family members, including a small child, in there and began putting the earth back over. As Brian noted, there are roads that are roads of the dead, body after body after body. It's very hot here. We, we're sunburned because it's 80 plus degrees here. This is the tropical Caribbean island. And that heat is beginning to take an effect on the bodies that are just left there. And people have masks on because there are areas where the stench is beginning to become overwhelming. And of course, medical authorities are concerned that people who are exhausted, people who have not been fed properly, people who have not had water, who have their immunities down, are now possibly going to be exposed to diseases that can develop with a body, or in this case, hundreds and thousands of bodies rotting on the streets. Um, because there's no government, there's nobody really in charge to say, let's pick those bodies up, Brian. Some family members are doing it uh, out of respect for the dead, but others are just too stunned and dazed. And my greatest fear is we began to see some of the anxiety today turn to anger as people were fighting over water. There are some fresh water supplies available. Prices have doubled. People are getting testy and pushing and screaming. And my fear is that if what is arriving here doesn't get to folks in the coming days, and I mean quickly, that that anger is begin to begin to boil over. Yeah, that you've taken people with very little and taken it down to nothing. Rachel, as we discussed last night, uh, th this won't take long to convert itself, and that's our fear here. We are um, amid reports of many people trying uh, to maintain civil behavior, maintain order as best they can in, as you describe, an essentially ungoverned, destroyed space right now. We are seeing some scenes and hearing those reports, as you say, of the anger boiling over, the frustration boiling over, and some growing disorder. Um, in terms of the, uh, the ability to alleviate that, we know that U.S. troops are arriving. We know also that the main task is to get that relief out of the airport and into the streets. What can you tell us about either of those plans? Well, first of all, let's start with the airport, the hub. It's under U.S. control. Not surrounded by troops, but the airstrip, when you, when you call in here to make a landing or a takeoff, you talk to an American air traffic controller. There's no tower. Uh, but second, the streets. Only now here is there starting to be a U.S. military presence. Their stance and their posture is going to be critical. Remember in Katrina, it was General Russell Honore who told them to put their muzzles down. They were there to help. And, and that is, is a crucial part of this. When they get here and start to fan out, I'm sorry we're fighting the jet engines as this cargo plane starts up. Uh, I'll throw in there, look, the U.N. has been here for a long time, and they have armored personnel carriers on the road. But, you know, the military speak would be rules of engagement. Their rules of engagement are to stand back. They are not to mix it up. If there's violence on the street, they are not to get involved in it. And so if there is violence on the street, they will come by, but they 
will not get out of their armored personnel carriers. Yes, they have weapons. Yes, they're armed. But they're not going to do that. And I don't even know whether the rules of engagement have been set for the U.S. military when they come here, when the military came here, when this country was falling apart, and, uh, and Bill Clinton sent in the Marines. The rules of engagement were do not get involved. It's a, it's a good decision, probably, because you don't want people turning on the military. But by the same token, they don't bring the law and order. They bring the supplies, which hopefully calm people down. Brian and Kerry, uh, people have survived a long time inside collapsed buildings in other disasters, but at 52 hours and counting now, there's worry that the window of opportunity to save people who are buried is closing. Are these elite search and rescue teams from all over the globe, are they actually getting out into the streets to do their work?